Ah, no, 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 no. Come on, this is not time change or anything like Good morning, Thomas Road. There we go. That's, that's a little bit better. We're so glad to have you here today. We are going to worship the Lord today, and we are going to help each other as we walk with Jesus and as we make other Christ followers. Uh, if you are brand new here today, if you're just walking in and you're a guest, you've never been here, thank you for coming. We always enjoy having our neighbors and our friends uh, show up. And if there's anything we can do for you, uh, you can fill out a Connect card for us. Uh, there is a, a little sticker on the seat back in front of you, and you could just scan that QR code. Uh, it'll pull up a Connect card, and any step that you want to take, you want more information about the church, uh, baptism, joining our church, getting in groups, whatever it may be, you fill that out, and we'll help you keep going with the Lord. A lot of exciting things coming up. Uh, in our church, always a lot of different events. This week we have on Tuesday night, we have our uh, TRIA, our Thomas Road Young Adults uh, meeting and uh, appreciate Pastor Stephen and the whole team. Uh, they've got another great event for you planned and actually all through the summer, if you're a young adult here in Lynchburg, they've got a lot of different things coming up and you would wanna connect with them. We also wanna pray and, and be celebrate that Pastor Stephen and Ashley, they're getting married this week. So yes, so pray for them. I guess he'll be focused on the event on Tuesday night. Uh, I don't know. For you all, Serve Day is coming up. This church, Thomas Road, you serve regularly. You are faithful in serving not only in the church, but you serve Central Virginia and Lynchburg. And uh, this next week, we're partnering with Liberty University, and we're gonna be going out and serving Thomas Schroeders. You have, we've got about five sites that you're owning, and you're gonna be working at some schools and some different projects. If you'd like to serve, you can go out to uh, Main Street after this service, and they will give you more information. Our missions and outreach team does a great job, and they wanted me to, uh, to remind you also, don't forget to bring those teal bags in for Parkview Mission. Uh, Thomas showed you collected about 800, you've brought in about 890 of the teal bags that are food supplies and different things for our community. Thank you for being good neighbors. Uh, good followers of Jesus are good neighbors. And then our outreach in camping. We have two great camps that we host each summer, our TRO, our Thomas Road Outpost, and Camp Hideaway. And so if you're interested in any, uh, anything about those two camps, they have their um, uh, exhibit out here today. You can sign up for Camp Hideaway with children. You need to start registering. Make sure you get in, uh, get that in. But they're also hiring uh, people for those camps. It's going to be a great day of serving the Lord. We're so glad that you've come here today. The psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. That means in every season of life, when the day is good, when the day is, is bad, his praise will be on our lips. Come on, church, stand together, let's worship. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in,
bless his name this morning no matter in the wilderness in the desert or on the high mountain top he's worthy and he's faithful and he wants to remind you of that this morning that he's truly good so we sing in faith your faithfulness it never runs dry it's a fountain flow with fullness of life. Your mercy falls down on us. Oh, we're so undeserving of your great love. This is his heart.
morning. You may be seated and turn your attention to the baptistry. Thank you. He is the king of all. Thank you, choir, orchestra, all the people for guiding us to the throne tonight, today. We also uh, want to celebrate four today who have made Christ king over all in their lives. And uh, so as we go to prayer real quick, we will pray for them and then baptize. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is to celebrate life change in these four candidates. We thank you for the uh, ability to be before your throne and to celebrate you as we pray um, and as we praise you uh, through worship as well. We do pray now that you would help Thomas Road to be faithful in the lives of all those that are here as well as in these four candidates to help to teach them and to guide them in a true and a faithful relationship with you. you we also pray that you would help this moment to be a highlight in their lives, a, a stone that they could look back on and remember, this is when I publicly told everybody that I am following you and for the rest of my lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, the first candidate we have is Clara, and Clara recently moved to Liberty University and got saved there at the same time. So, Clara, uh, thank you for being here. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I have. Excellent. Well, upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the Lord's command, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations. <laughs> Excellent. Next, we have Rebecca. Rebecca was saved at a, a young age and uh, rededicated herself recently to uh, Christ with her grandparents. So, Rebecca, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? I have. Excellent. Well, upon the profession of faith and obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, for in likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Excellent. Wonderful. Now we have Emma Kalefich. Emma, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? Wonderful. Well, upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son. Go ahead. You can hold. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> hold, you want to hold my arm? Okay. <laughs> Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Now, Emma, if you want to just stand right there. Now, Emma's older brother is coming to be baptized, and this is Liam. And it happens to be a special day for Liam. Liam was born uh, is it 13 years ago today. Excellent. So it's his birthday. We should sing. <laughs> you probably don't want me singing. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, uh, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? Excellent. Well, upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, Liam, and my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. <laughs> it's been done as the Lord commanded. <laughs>
Thank you to this amazing choir and orchestra and Zach Bruno, who's leading both today. Thank you so much for that. Hey, isn't it great to be able to come to the house of God to worship together in music, to worship in celebration of baptism, those who've come to know Christ. And uh, just a, every week that we have this great privilege and this great opportunity because today there are a lot of people around the world who do not have that opportunity, do not have that privilege. And so we certainly want to remember uh, that we are blessed here in this country. With all of our foibles, all of our problems, all of our challenges, all the division, all the things that we see, God is still great. God is still good here. We're going to pass the offering plates now, receive our offering here this morning, and encourage you to be faithful in your tithes and offering and your giving as we continue to take that message around the world. Uh, obviously, today, a great opportunity uh, through this serve opportunity that you uh, see that you not only you can give in resources, but you can give in time, and so we encourage you to be faithful in that as well. Hey, I want to share some prayer requests with you today that we want to remember in prayer, and we want to recognize a lot of people who are hurting. We're going to mention a lot of names, but we also recognize a lot of people in this room, maybe watching, maybe listening, that I may not mention your name, but we know you're going through difficult times, and we certainly want to uh, understand that God knows what you're going through, and as we pray together today, uh, that God also will meet your need. And so I want to share these requests, share these names, and, and as I do, I encourage you, as I always do, to write down one or two, just take them with you and pray over them, pray, uh, you know, one or two names that you just kind of pick out of this list throughout this week as we continue to lift them up in prayer. So we want to pray for Joyce Gaddy and Dennis Iverson. We want to pray for A.E. Newcomb III, uh, for Jennifer Mixon. We want to pray for her and Corey Hammock and Paul Rotigliano still up at UVA and still in intensive care. We want to remember him in prayer. Also, we want to pray for, <clears throat> excuse me, for Lee Cowan and Amanda Crosswhite, uh, Vicki Cusick, Gail Gillespie and Melody Gunter, uh, Phil Pantana over at Lynchburg General and Emmeline Helvig. We want to pray for Doris Perry, uh, Heather Kirk and Madison Krantz, and Tim Lax, and Edna Little, Mike Marino and Patricia Peary, uh, Amy Sandage, Stan Schock Jr. And then we want to pray for the family of Glenn Anderson who passed away uh, on Friday night. Uh, Glenn was a longtime member of the Lynchburg Police Department and retired there a few years ago and came to work at Liberty University Police Department, and he passed away on Friday. And so we want to remember his family in the midst of their loss. That service will be right here on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. And so, again, a lot of people were hurting, but, you know, one other prayer request I'll share with you today. Um, I've been moved and, and really kind of struck this week with what we're seeing take place in our nation. This uh, wholesale throwing out of truth that is so prevalent in every area of our culture today, and whether it be in Washington or whether it even be right here in Lynchburg, that so many people are walking away from what we know to be true, walking away from what is more common sense, really. And so we sit back and we complain about it. We lament the problems we're facing in our nation. We are shocked by some of the things that our leaders do. Uh, in, in, in redefining what truth is and redefining what humans are. But here's what I will tell you, that no matter who our leaders are, no matter who our president is or vice president, no matter who is sitting on the Supreme Court, no matter who is sitting in the House or the Senate in Washington or in the governor's mansions or in the state houses across our country, that there is one king and his name is Jesus. And today, while we certainly face all of the challenges and all of the division that is so prevalent, we, the body of Christ, we need to continue to be praying for our nation. We need to be continuing to pray that God would bring revival in this land. And by the way, that is the R that this country needs. It's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's revival. That's what we need in our nation today. And if we could see revival sweep across this land, I believe all of the challenges, all the problems that we face each and every day, it will be fixed. Not because people are leaning towards a political party, but they are leaning towards the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we, the body of Christ, we're commanded to do it in scripture. Let us never forget daily to be praying for our leaders, to be praying for our nation, and to be praying for revival. Let's pray together. 
Father, today we are grateful for who you are. God, our hearts are full as we have had the opportunity this morning of worship and celebration, God, of who you are and the gift of your son, Jesus, that he died and that he rose again. And whether through music or whether through baptism or whether through giving, whether through serving, God, all of those are, are just simply a, a representation of how full we are because of the gift of your son, Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that today for all of us in this room, God, that you would help us to never forget who you are, never forget the great gift you've given. And God, we know there are a lot of people who are hurting. I've mentioned a lot of names here. There are many that I did not mention. Lord, who need a, a healing touch, a, a restorative touch. They, they need you, God, to show up in the midst of what they're walking through. And whether it's health or uh, financial or, or, or marriage, relationship issues, God, whether, whatever it is, God, they need you as the great physician and the great healer. God, that you would come and give them the peace and the joy, the comfort, Lord, that they need in these moments. God, for our nation today, Lord, we are in a tough spot. Lord, there is so much going on in our nation, which I know, uh, Lord, not only dishonors the word of God, but it disappoints you as the creator of the universe. And so God, I do pray for our leaders. I pray that you would turn their hearts towards you. God, that they would recognize and understand, God, we can't redefine truth. The truth is truth, and it has always been truth, and that truth comes from you. And God, I pray that we would see revival that would sweep across this land. And Lord, let it start with us. Let it be from right here, even in this church, God, how wonderful it would be that a revival that would truly uh, be an awakening in our nation, in our world, God, that it would start right here in Little Lynchburg. That would be an awesome opportunity, God. We pray that you would turn our hearts toward that truth. God, we pray for, Lord, people around the nation, around the world today who are not having the opportunity of joining together like we are. God, a lot of people who are kept away from being able to worship you in truth and in spirit. God, I, I pray that in those countries where, Lord, that, that they're persecuted for their faith, God, we pray that you would bring protection. God, in the, the skirmishes and the wars and the battles that are taking place, God, around the globe, God, we pray that you would bring peace. Lord, we pray for Israel today. God, we pray for, Lord, so many situations, there are too many to list. God, where what we really need is, Lord, we don't need a political fix. We need a touch from your hand. And God, I pray that you would provide it today. Lord, bless our time together today. Speak to us through your word. Lord, allow us today to hear from you. And if there's someone here who doesn't know you, has never accepted that great gift of the gift of the gospel, God, I pray that this would be the day that they'd finally believe that Jesus died and rose again. And today would be the day of salvation. And for that, Father, we give you all the praise, all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again, cause all that I
Sing that again. So I throw out my head, praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know it's not nothing else before me. Sometimes when we come into the presence of the Lord like we are here today, I think sometimes we fail to remember that we are in the presence of a king. Not just a king, the king. And when you stand in the presence of the king, the first thing you realize is just how unworthy we are. I've got nothing else fit for a king. Certainly don't belong to be in his presence. I don't, I don't deserve it. And yet here we are. Not because we earned the right, but because he invited us. Every time you come into the presence of the Lord in a situation of worship like this corporately, just remember, it's because the king of kings has graciously invited you to come on into his throne room. And because of that, it's an absolute privilege to stand before him and to praise his name in thankfulness, in honor, not because we're worthy, but because he is. And because he gave us life, and he gave us hope, and he gave us peace, and he gave us forgiveness. So let's go to him now. Father, we love you. And we sing these songs with gratitude in our hearts because you really are worthy. And you're the only one who is. 
You're the reason we have hope today, Lord. And if it hadn't been for your forgiveness, we'd be in so much debt. So God, we are grateful. We are grateful for the privilege of being in your presence today. And now, Lord, as we open your word in your presence, our prayers that you would open our hearts, open our minds to the power of your word and teach us today, Lord, teach us from your word so that we leave here, Father, broken and ready to do whatever it is that your spirit leads us to do. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Thank you, guys. I love that song. I, I used to sing that song all the time when I was dealing with COVID because of that bridge. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on my... Um, lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of your lungs. I, I couldn't get anything in my lungs, let, let alone a lion. So I was, uh, I was always uh, encouraged by the words of that song and kept thinking to myself, if I can just get past this little virus and get enough air in my lungs again, I won't worship the Lord shyly ever again. <clears throat> I think sometimes we come into a room like this and because there's so many people and it's so big, we're a little hesitant to just throw up our hands and praise the Lord. I would encourage you to not be that way. Uh, you're in the presence of the King and your worship is an individual response to him even though you're in a, bunch of, a room with a bunch of people. And so praise the Lord with all your heart, boldly and loudly because he inhabits those praises, doesn't he? Well, we're in the middle of this series on the parables of Jesus. I love this series, Beyond Words, because you see, parables were how Jesus taught us. They were earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. They were stories that really kind of give us an autobiography of what God is like. And Jesus begins so many of his parables with this phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he goes into the story, right? Well, today we're dealing with a pretty heavy topic. I, I wish it was sunny and warm outside because honestly, the spirit of the room is different when it's sunny and warm. When it's cold and rainy and gloomy, I so bad wanted to have a topic for you that was so incredibly happy, but this one's not. Sometimes my job is to comfort the afflicted. Today, my job is to afflict the comforted. So I apologize in advance. Let me just begin this way. May 31st, 1980, it was a Friday night, Madisonville, Louisiana. Debbie Morris, 16 years old, was on a date with her boyfriend, Mark Brewster. They had just picked up a few milkshakes and gone out to the river walk to enjoy a sunset by the river. And as they were sitting in the car, Mark was leaning against the passenger doorway Debbie was leaning against the, pass the, the driver doorway, and Debbie was leaning against the passenger doorway, and suddenly a pickup pulls up beside them. Out of the pickup jumped two young men. One man's name was Robert Willie. The other man's name was Joseph Vaccaro. They jumped out of the pickup, ran over to, to where Mark and Debbie were sitting in their car, sling the door open, put a gun to Mark's head, they get in the car with Mark and Debbie and tell Mark to start driving. Mark gets about 15 miles outside of town. They tell him to pull over. They drag Mark out of the car, torture him, hang him from a tree, shoot him in the head, and leave him for dead. And then for the next 30 hours, they proceeded to do things to this teenage girl, Debbie, that are unspeakable. If you'd like to read the story, you can read it for yourself. It's all documented online everywhere in her own book called Forgiving the Dead Man Walking. It wasn't until five years later that Robert Willie and Joseph Caro entered a courtroom where they would be tried, not just for the abduction of Debbie Morris and the torture of Mark Brewster, but also for the murder of Faith Hathaway that had taken place just three days before they abducted Debbie. You find the whole story in a movie called Dead Man Walking. But those 30 hours were pure torture for Debbie. And even though 
Robert was sentenced to die, and Joseph was given 12 life sentences for what they had done. It didn't bring closure to Debbie's life until she came to know the Lord and discovered something incredible called forgiveness. We're gonna be talking about forgiveness today. And I have to ask you, maybe something that terrible, like what happened in Debbie Morris's life has happened to you, but there's not a person in this room who hasn't been hurt or hasn't experienced some sort of loss or anger or something that's happened to you that required you giving them forgiveness. And there's not a, certain, there's not a single person in this room that hasn't done something to someone else that required you to ask them to forgive you. It's a very heavy topic, and it's the most important topic outside of love that I can find in all of Scripture. Can you just imagine the anger and the bitterness that you would have in your heart towards these two individuals if that crime happened to you like it did to Debbie Morris? Can you imagine if it happened to your daughter? Can you imagine if it happened to your wife? And unfortunately, in this world, those kind of crimes take place every day. So I want to ask you before we really jump in, has anybody ever done you wrong? Were you ever able to forgive them? Or do you still hold a grudge? Is it eating away at you inside? The subject of forgiveness cuts straight to the heart of all of us. And this parable that we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 18 may be one of the most important parables Jesus ever told. Its message is at the heart of everything he taught, and its message is also at the very heart of salvation itself. So the question of the day is simply this, how do we become people who really forgive? Will you look at Matthew 18 with me? Leading up to these verses, Jesus has been teaching the disciples quite a bit. It's a wonderful chapter of instruction. In fact, verses 15 through 20 alone, Jesus tells us how to deal with conflict inside the church body. And he's talking about how when someone sins, how you deal with this, not just as an individual, but as a group, as a church. And so the subject of sin comes up, and then Peter asks Jesus this question. And don't you love Peter? I, every time I, 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 I see the phrase, and then Peter, in Scripture, I get encouraged because he's usually going to ask something kind of bold and maybe sometimes something sort of stupid. He just, I like him because I identify with Peter. He's always doing something that's kind of like, he's, he blurts out of his mouth what everybody else is thinking, but he's just the one that has the boldness to ask it. A lot of times he puts his foot in his mouth. This particular time, he appears like he's got it together. Look what he says. Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now, this sounds pretty generous to Peter because, you see, in that day, there was a rabbinical teaching that was actually taken from the book of Amos. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a bit of a, of a miscalculation of what exactly the book of Amos is talking about there when God talks to them about uh, forgiving them up to three times. But uh, what happens is, is the, the rabbis took this teaching in Amos and, and really built an entire culture around it. And so the mindset in Jewish culture at that time was you were only supposed to forgive somebody up to three times for the same offense. After that, you didn't have to forgive them anymore. So it was sort of a three strikes and you're out sort of culture. So when Peter comes to Jesus and says, do I need to forgive him seven times? In the mind of Peter, he's thinking, man, this is twice what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to go ahead and add another one for good measure. I sound pretty spiritual doing this. So up to seven times, and then Jesus answers and says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, Jesus, when he says that, is actually using a, what's known as a Hebraism. It's a figure of speech in the Hebrew language that actually means on and on into infinity. He doesn't just mean up to 490 times. Now, some of you have actually taken that literally throughout your years and thought, okay, I don't have to forgive somebody 70 times, but I have to forgive them at least 490 times. And you may have even set an alarm on your phone so that when somebody gets to number 480 or so, it's going to go off, right? Oh, John, he's, he's up to 482 now, so he's got eight more times that I don't have to forgive him anymore. That's not what Jesus is talking about. 
Rather, he's simply saying that our heart of forgiveness should have no end to it, that we should cultivate a spirit of forgiveness rather than practicing a habit of counting how many times we've been wronged. I love what Richard Donovan says about this. He says this, to keep track is not to forgive, but is rather to record progress toward the day when we quit forgiving. A person keeping records of forgiveness is like a rogue banker whose motive is foreclosure. What Jesus is saying is, don't be counting. It's not about counting. It's having a spirit of forgiveness that is ongoing. So then Jesus, in order to explain himself further, begins to tell this parable. Verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle the accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, a talent in the Hebrew monetary system was a massive amount of money. One talent equaled 20 years worth of wages for the average worker in the time of Israel. So I looked this up, and I thought, well, if that is 20 years worth of wages, what is the median income for an American in today's society? In 2024, not median salary, but median income, meaning those who work hourly wages, those who work salary wages, and believe it or not, is a little higher than I thought. The median wages for an American in 2024 is $59,384. So let's just round it down to $59,000. Now, some of you make more than that in this room. Some of you make less than that. But that's the American average. That would mean that 20 years salary making $59,000 a year is $1.187 million. All right? That's the equivalent of one talent back in the times of Jesus. $1.187 million. But this servant doesn't owe the king just one talent. He owes him 10,000 talents. So if you were to take the median income of $59,000 times 20 years and then times that by 10,000, what it would mean today is that this servant owes his king somewhere just south of $1.2 billion. Now that's a massive debt if I ever heard of one. In fact, just to give you an idea of how much a talent was, the entire region of Galilee operated on a budget of less than 300 talents a year. So it was a huge sum of money that this servant owes. Verse 25, but as the servant was not able to pay, his master, the king, commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and that payment be made. Now, again, this was a custom of the day. This is a very common custom where if a servant can't pay his debts, he gets sold into slavery along with his family, and the owner or the king or the, 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 the one who is in charge of the servant takes control of all of his possessions. Verse 26, then the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Yeah, right. Liar, liar, pants on fire. There's no way he's going to pay back $1.2 billion, right? So the master of that servant, the king, is now moved with compassion. I love that word, compassion. It's the same word I gave you. Remember a couple weeks ago when I told you the story of the widow who had lost her son and Jesus saw her with compassion? There's this Greek word called splenitsomai, and that's the exact same word that's used here. That king felt compassion for this servant and so he released him and forgave him the debt verse 28 but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii now a denarii was uh, was only equal to one day's wages for a servant in that day so the average day wage of a full-time American worker is, again, a little higher than I thought. Uh, the, the, the statistics say it's $229. Now, there are many in this room that don't make $229 a day. But on average, that's what Americans make is around $200 a day. So if this were today, then the servant who owed the other servant money owed him about $22,000. So you have one servant who owes his king $1.2 billion, and you have another servant who owes this servant just $22,000. And look what he does. 
He lays hands on him and takes him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me. I will pay you all. This is the same words that this servant used for his king. And now he's got another servant that's begging before him, wanting him to forgive him of his debts. But he would not, the Bible says in verse 30. He went and threw him into prison till he should pay back the debt. So when his fellow servants, now we got other people that are seeing all that's happening, right? They see what happens, they see what's been done, and they're very grieved. And they came to the king, the master, and they told the master all that this servant had done to the other servant. And then the master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Verse 35, don't miss this. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So how do we become a person who forgives? Well, it's an absolute necessity in all of our lives. It's obvious that this is not an option. It's a command. And the consequences of not forgiving are quite severe, as we just read in verse 35. See, Jesus doesn't just mention this one time in Scripture. He actually mentions this several times in Scripture. Even in the model prayer. Do you remember when the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus gave us the model prayer? Teaching us how to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In verse 12 of chapter 6 of the book of Matthew, Jesus is giving us that model prayer. And in that prayer, everybody knows it, is this phrase. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Right? And then verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Then in verse 14, Jesus circles right back around to that same subject again of forgiveness. Right after he gives the model prayer, he says this. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Jesus doubles down on this. Luke chapter 6, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will come back against you. Forgive others and then you will be forgiven. Luke 17, if another believer sins, rebuke that person, but then if there's repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks forgiveness, you must forgive. After Jesus cursed the fig tree in Mark chapter 11, what did he say? If you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Do you see the pattern? It's our responsibility to forgive. And until we do, we're not forgiven. You know, it was when Debbie Morris found the grace to forgive Robert Willie, which was actually the day that he was supposed to be executed that she finally knew release from the suffering that was happening in her own life. In prayer for herself and for Willie, she discovered that only God's grace is sufficient to bind up the wounds of the human heart. Forgiveness is much more than telling ourselves that an offense just doesn't matter anymore. On the contrary, forgiveness recognizes the debt for what it is, and it doesn't just liberate the debtor from the debt, it transforms the heart of the one who's doing the forgiving. So to forgive is not an act of weakness. It's a courageous act of strength and compassion. And it's way easier to talk about it than it is to actually do it. Many people perceive forgiveness as a sign of vulnerability or surrender, but in reality, it takes an immense amount of strength to let go of your anger and resentment. Forgiveness is not pretending as though something didn't happen or that it didn't hurt you or cause you pain. But I love what Tony Evans said. He said this, forgiveness is a decision of the will to no longer charge the bill. It's a decision to release a debt 
in spite of how you feel, because forgiveness is not based on a feeling. Rather, forgiveness is a decision that starts in your mind and must permeate your heart. And once you finally get there, it frees your soul. So, I've given you this statement before, and I live by it. If you want to live, forgive. It's in letting the issue and your hate and all your bitterness that comes with it just die. And then you find life and freedom again in your heart. Just like cancer deep within the body, bitterness is the silent killer of the soul. I look at it this way. Have you ever chained up a dog so that he couldn't run away? You know, when you put that collar on that dog, he can't pull away because there's a chain connected to a wall or a stake. Some of you are bound by a chain today. And every length of the chain is either bitterness or anger or resentment or hurt or your past or whatever it might be. And if you just follow the length of that chain, you finally hit a wall where that chain is connected. And you know what that chain is connected to? You know what it's called? Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. John reminds us in the book of 1 John that if we claim to love God and don't love others, then we're liars. Jesus says we must love one another. And our love for others is demonstrated in how we treat others, how we serve others, how we forgive others when they wrong us. So if you claim to love God, you're going to love people. And if you love people, then you're going to be one who forgives. How do I know that? Because of 1 Corinthians 13. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It lets it go. Sorry, this mic is rubbing up against my whiskers. And I shaved this morning. So if you're a Christian, you forgive and you love. If you don't forgive and you don't love, and listen, I thought long and hard about the statement before I make it, but it really is true. I, it, it's just backed up by Scripture over and over and over again. If you don't love and if you don't forgive, then you need to evaluate if you really are a Christian. Because that is what Christians do. And we've been forgiven as believers far more than we could ever forgive. We're all debtors to the king who paid a debt he didn't know, and we owed a debt we couldn't pay. I don't know if you have anyone in your life that you need to forgive, I mean really forgive. Or maybe you need to seek forgiveness from somebody else. But when it comes to forgiveness, I wanna give you a few things that I hope will help you along your way. Two things we must do in forgiving or in accepting forgiveness. First of all, accept the forgiveness of God. We have to learn how to accept the forgiveness of God. You know, in some parables, you have to think through which character represents who in the story, right? Oh, and here's a little spoiler alert. Anytime Jesus mentions the master, the king, or the father, he's talking about God the Father, all right? That's a little spoiler alert for you. Every parable we talk about, but in this parable, it's easy to see who we are in the story. We are all the wicked servant who's been forgiven this massive debt. But often because we get settled in our faith or when we don't spend much time in the word or don't spend enough time serving others, what happens is as believers, we get real comfortable and complacent, especially those of us who, who grew up in the church. And we begin to just sort of assume his forgiveness and that leads to making light of sin, and in the process, we end up cheapening his grace. And this happens a lot with us church folk. And that's why one thing you don't see a lot on Sunday morning services in America is brokenness. It's the missing element in a lot of Christians because we've simply forgotten the amount of debt from which we've been forgiven. Oh, man. You see, brokenness only comes when you get to the end of yourself and you realize God is all you've got left. And from that place of brokenness comes a heart of gratitude we just sang about. And that's why when you do get around somebody 
who's just been saved out of a life of debauchery or who has just been rescued from their sin after dealing with all kinds of heartache in their life, what you discover is, is, is brokenness. Because when you come across someone who's been to the bottom of the pit and they've hung out there a little while and then they were rescued by the love of Jesus, what you typically find is someone who's truly thankful because it's from the heart of the radically saved that you find a radical thankfulness for the boundless grace and the unfathomable forgiveness of God. And when you really consider this, you come to realize that we've all been radically saved because we were all wretched sinners in desperate need of a savior who forgives radically. And some of us were saved out of stuff. Some of us were saved from stuff. I was saved at six years old, but even at six years old, even though I wasn't a drug addict or, you know, selling drugs or running around, you know, on my wife or something like that, I was still a sinner because I was born that way. And thank God Jesus saved me out of stuff, but because, I mean, from stuff, but because he saved me from stuff, sometimes I'm, I'm a little tempted to just get a little complacent about the cost of this grace. But those who were saved out of stuff, they tend to never get over it because they realize just how radical his forgiveness is. First John one time, we hear this verse all the time. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, when we repent, God forgives. It's that simple. He is faithful and just. And our repentance justifies us in the sight of God Almighty through the blood of his son. And it becomes just as if I'd never sinned. That's how you define the word justification. Just as if I'd never sinned. So have you ever accepted the indescribable, unconditional forgiveness of God in your life? If not, I implore you, repent today. Surrender your heart to him. He'll forgive you, and he'll give you new life like you never imagined. So accept the forgiveness of God. But another thing we need to do is to practice the forgiveness of God. Listen, forgiveness doesn't mean that you enable or accommodate or condone or ignore sinful behavior. No, quite the contrary. Forgiveness means that you face it for what it is, for what it really is, and then you choose to forgive anyway. You know, Jesus does not mean that we allow ourselves to be abused or used or robbed or taken advantage of. Jesus isn't asking you to be a doormat, but what he does is he expects us to be a doorway that opens people up to the reality that there is another kingdom, the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God offers forgiveness. Every one of us have stood on both sides of this equation, haven't we? We've either had to ask for forgiveness or we've all had to forgive someone else. And if you live long enough, you'll stand on both sides of that word many times in your life. So forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean restoration, but hopefully that is what takes place. Not always. It doesn't come with strings attached either. As I learned from Tony Evans this week, forgiveness is two things. It's unilateral and it's transactional. Unilateral forgiveness is when we forgive someone even though they have shown no repentance on their side. Either because they refuse to repent or they don't think they wronged you in any way or they're no longer around. Like for instance, if you had an, a, an uncle or something that abused you as a child and now he's passed away, he's no longer allowed, around to ask you for forgiveness. So do you forgive him anyway? The answer is yes, because forgiveness must be unilateral, not for their sake, but for yours. But forgiveness is not just unilateral, it's also transactional. And that's when repentance does take place. And it's an exchange that goes on. There's a repentance, and in response to the repentance, you offer forgiveness. And usually when this happens, restoration follows. And it's a beautiful thing. But in the process, I want to warn you to guard yourself against an unforgiving spirit that is never from God. Beware of the unforgiving heart because the very highest form of hypocrisy is an unforgiving spirit. 
Why? Because our very salvation alone is based off of forgiveness, right? An unforgiving heart becomes a hindrance to our faith and our growth as believers. An unforgiving heart will certainly rob us of the freedom in our faith. An unforgiving heart is like locking yourself into a prison cell and then throwing away the key. You become the one who's imprisoned, even more so than the one who did you wrong. I've uh, just been introduced by Tim Clinton, our, uh, one of our, one, our, our wonderful counselor who runs uh, American Association of Christian Counselors. He introduced me to a man this week named Everett Worthington. He just spoke here on Thursday. He's the world's leading authority on what forgiveness and unforgiveness does to your body physically. Can you believe that? It was just here on Thursday. What timing. He's done an, amount, an, an immense amount of research in this area and has clinically proven, along with many others, that, that holding a grudge, not forgiving someone, is actually detrimental to your health. It leads to depression, anxiety, even cardiovascular issues, stress, and much more. And so he offers up a five-step process developed for practicing forgiveness. And I, I put this in our notes, and it's also on your app, so that you make sure and recall it many, many times. But he gives us a little acrostic for the word reach. And this is a five-step process for practicing forgiveness. R is for recall. It, re it means remembering the hurt that was done to you as objectively as you can. E is for empathize. Trying to understand the viewpoint of the person who has wronged you. A is for altruism. Thinking about a time you hurt someone or were forgiven and then offering the gift of forgiveness to the person who hurt you. C is for committing. Publicly forgiving the person who actually wronged you. And H is for holding on. Not forgetting the hurt, but reminding yourself that you're the one who made the choice to forgive. I like that. You'll find it in the app. It's very helpful. Go back to it as many times as you wish. But let me just give you this, and don't miss this. Forgiveness is the roadway to freedom with God. That's why I entitled this message, The Freedom of Forgiveness, because the result of forgiveness is freedom for you. The way to get it is to give it. And we must have a forgiving spirit, even to those who've wronged us greatly. If we don't, it will rob us of our joy. It will hinder our worship. It will create a seed of bitterness in your heart that can last a lifetime. And the real loser in the whole situation becomes you. Forgiveness is not condoning what's been done, but rather you're determining to let it go. You're removing the situation from taking up space in your head and in your heart where it's dwelling there rent-free. And this will set you free from the chain of bitterness that has kept you bound all these years. Practice the forgiveness of God. Set the prisoner free and watch God set you free. I'll say it again. If you want to live, forgive. So how do we practice the forgiveness of God? Well, we practice it by forgiving others just like God forgave us. Have you ever accepted the forgiveness of God? Do you know what it is to have Jesus come into your life and forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and set you free? If you've never met him, you can meet him today. And I want to invite you to do that. It's simply done through a prayer. You just simply ask him into your life to forgive you of your sins. And you know what he'll do? He'll come into your life and he'll change you, not just for now, forever so as we close today I'm gonna to give you four things that model the forgiveness of God four things about the forgiveness of God that he gives us that if we'll model this we'll truly learn how to live a life of forgiveness first of all God forgives completely there's that word again justification he forgives you so much that it becomes just as if you'd never sinned Psalm 103 tells us that God throws our sins from the, as far as the east is from the west. Have you ever tried to go east to get west? It's a long ways. God throws your sins there. I love what one pastor said. He said, God takes your sin and he throws them into the bottom of the sea and then he posts a no fishing sign. I like that. 
Isaiah 43 says that God blots out our transgressions and he remembers our sins no more. Jeremiah 31 says, I will forgive their sin and their sin I will remember no more. God forgives us completely. Does that free you today? It sure does me. Because when God forgives, he forgives and he also forgets. God forgives completely. You know what else? God forgives repeatedly. If Jesus has called us to forgive 70 times seven, then surely he would do so himself. In fact, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us every time. Look up Micah chapter seven, look up Colossians three, look up Hebrews chapter eight, look up Second Chronicles chapter seven, and so many more verses in scripture that remind you that God repeatedly, over and over and over and over again, will forgive his people if we do one thing, repent, repent. God is merciful to the repentant, not the defiant. Thirdly, God forgives generously it just dawned on me this week that inside the word forgives is the word gives. Just drop the four. There it is. The debt of this servant in this parable was so incredibly vast that it would have taken him a thousand lifetimes to pay it back. And so the gift the king gives him in forgiving his debt is massive. The king knows there's no way the servant can ever pay him back. What kind of king, I ask myself, loans a servant that kind of money? I mean, honestly, it sounds a little irresponsible and reckless to me, doesn't it, you? Well, I'll tell you what kind of king does that. Our king. The kind of king who loves so lavishly and forgives so freely and is so magnificently merciful that no matter how deep in the pit you have fallen, there is no pit so deep that the love and the forgiveness of our king cannot reach down and pull you out. No matter how far you've run, there's not a place you can go where the grace of our king cannot reach you. That is our king. And the debt we owe is so vast, and yet there's no amount of debt no amount of sin that we've ever incurred that God can't and won't forgive. God forgives generously. And lastly, God forgives freely. Forgiveness is an imitation of God's own act of forgiveness on the cross, which of course was an act that cost him everything and it cost us nothing. The price has already been paid for your forgiveness. It was paid on a hill called Mount Calvary. And it was there that our burdened souls found liberty. It was there that grace and mercy merged with forgiveness and delivered for us all hope. Hope that is secured by his resurrection and is sealed by his love. What does Romans tell us? For the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God forgives freely. God forgives repeatedly. God forgives generously. God forgives completely. So if that's the forgiveness of God, how can we not forgive? Maybe you've never been kidnapped or tortured like Debbie Morris, but maybe you have been abused lied to, mistreated, betrayed, ignored, stolen from, cheated on, set up, or taken advantage of. Live long enough, most every bit of this will happen to you. People used to ask Debbie Morris if forgiveness is really worth it. Here was her response. The cost of forgiveness is nothing compared to the benefits of forgiveness. I feel like I have found new life through forgiveness. Eventually, I came to understand and to believe not only in my head, but also in my heart that God loved Robert Willie as much as he loved me. 
See, Debbie learned the power of forgiveness in her life, and you know what it did? It set her free. Now, I challenge you today to go and do likewise. Is there someone in your life you need to forgive? Is there someone from who you need to seek forgiveness? Listen, don't let the sun set on this day without dealing with this. Go to who you need to go to. Call who you need to call. Sit down with who you need to sit down with, but don't let the sun set until you deal with this. It is truly one of the most important and Christ-like things you could ever possibly do. I have a friend named Lisa Turkhurst. I do a lot of conferences with her. She's a wonderful speaker and writer. She wrote a book called Forgiving What You Can't Forget. If you're dealing with this issue, I would highly encourage you to get this book. And in this book, she makes a statement. She said this, forgiveness is the weapon. Our choices moving forward are the battlefield and moving on is the journey. If you will learn to forgive completely, forgive repeatedly, forgive generously, and forgive freely, you will discover that even though you may have been wronged, your soul can be set free. And those who the Son has set free are free indeed. So if you've ever wondered when the time was right to forgive, I'll tell you when the time is. The time is right now. The time is right now. It is time that we all discovered the freedom of forgiveness. Will you bow your heads with me, please? In the quietness of this moment, I just want you to examine your heart. If I was to go through every chair on every row and say, give me a name, I promise you there's not a soul in this room who couldn't give me the name of somebody they're struggling to forgive. And yet Jesus says, do it. And the sooner you forgive, the sooner you find freedom in your soul. It's not an option, folks. It's a command. You know, as we were sitting over here singing our songs of worship, I was reminded that we have these cards and these pens. If you don't have something to write on or you don't want to put this note in your phone, come take one of these cards and pen and simply write down the names of the people in your life that you need to forgive. And then on the other side of that card, I'd write down the names of the people that you need to seek forgiveness from. Because folks, if the church body, if the kingdom of heaven is going to function like God intends it to function, then it needs to be founded on two things, love and forgiveness. That's it. So who do you need to forgive today? Do you need to be forgiven? Only you know, and only God knows. And I don't mean just, oh yeah, I forgive you. No, I mean, from the heart, the Bible says. From the heart. But here's the deal. Once you forgive, listen, it's done. Let it go. Move on. Move on. That's how it works. Just like God forgave you. Will you stand with me? As we begin to sing, Maybe you just need to come to the altar, ask God to give you the strength to do this. Maybe you need to walk across the room and go straight to the face of somebody who needs your forgiveness. I don't know. All I know is this is your moment to do business with God. Don't let it pass you by. All right? Let's sing together. I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken And I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again Oh, thank you, Lord Amazing love That you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And 
Here's how we're going to finish this thing. We're going to go to that bridge. The bridge says, you are my king. We're just going to sing the same king that Jesus talks about. The king that forgives our debts is the one who's worthy of our worship. Can we sing that bridge? And then we're going to sing the chorus together and celebrate the love of Jesus as we leave. Come on, sing it together. So this is big stuff and little stuff. So on your way home, somebody cuts you off on the highway. What are you going to do? Forgive. God bless you. Have a great week, everybody. Come on. I want to thank you for joining with us today. If you've never come to the place of recognition in your life of being a sinner and needing a Savior, you can do so right now. Believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again to give you eternal life. Just ask him to save you today. If you would like to talk further about what it is that God has done for you in the giving of his son, Jesus, we would love to chat with you about that. I would encourage you to email us at the address that is on the screen, pastor at trbc.org. We would love to connect with you to help you begin a brand new journey with Jesus Christ in your life. And if you would like to help to contribute to our ministry as we take this message of the gospel around the world, go to the link on the screen today and help us help others with the amazing message of God's love, to let them know that God loves them, that Christ died for them, that he rose again, and through Christ, we have hope.